There are few things as iconic in medicine as the ECG pattern. Watch any medical drama series, and at some point, you'll see an unconscious patient hooked up to a monitor with the pattern spreading over the screen. My personal favorite still has to be Monty Python's reference to the machine that goes ping. Get the machine that goes ping. That's the machine that goes ping. Ah, I see you have the machine that goes ping. But despite its ubiquity in medical practice, few people have a clear understanding of what this pattern really represents, aside from the fact that it's the heart working. I mean, what is making the signal in the first place? Turns out, it's a visual representation of the movement of electrical activity through the heart to generate cardiac muscle contraction. In this session, we'll look at the anatomy of the conduction system of the heart and correlate the flow of electrical impulses to the function of the heart as we introduce you to the cardiac cycle. Welcome back. In the previous session, we discussed most of the structural elements of the heart. We looked at the four chambers and their contents, the connective tissue skeleton and valves, and the vascular supply to the heart tissue. What we haven't included as of yet is the conductance system of the heart. Embedded within the heart walls is an interconnected system of highly specialized nerve cells that initiate and propagate action potentials in a highly organized pattern. This ensures that the depolarization and contraction of cardiac muscle tissue occurs in a systematic fashion. This repeating process of contraction and relaxation is known as the cardiac cycle. Now for this session, we're going to begin by looking at the anatomy of the conduction system of the heart and trace the movement of an electrical impulse through this system. We'll then describe the stages of the cardiac cycle in detail, looking at excitation, wall contraction, valve function, and blood flow through each of these stages. Chances are that you are familiar with this particular scene from Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom, where the high priest tears the beating heart out of a human sacrifice. We won't critique the scene too critically. I can assure you, for example, having removed hearts from hundreds of cadavers is not nearly that easy. But believe it or not, under the right circumstances, a heart will continue to beat after being removed from the body of a living person, without any neural input whatsoever. Here, we see a beating human heart being prepared for transplant surgery, completely outside of the body. So how does this work? It has to do with the sodium ion channels found in the membranes of these specialized neurons. In most nerve tissue, these channels remain closed unless stimulated by an action potential. In the nerve cells associated with the heart, however, there is a number of leaky channels which open and close intermittently, allowing a constant stream of sodium to move down its concentration gradient into the cell. As a result, the resting membrane potential gradually creeps up towards the threshold potential, allowing the cells to spontaneously depolarize without any external neural input. This is known as autorhythmicity. These leaky channels are found throughout the nervous tissue of the heart, but their concentrations vary. Regions with higher concentrations of these channels have more leakage and therefore reach threshold potential faster. The fastest rate of depolarization is seen in the sinoatrial node, commonly abbreviated the SA node. It's made up of a small cluster of cells located in the wall of the right atrium, just lateral to the entrance for the superior vena cava. Once depolarization occurs in the SA node, the action potential propagates along the conduction pathway, triggering depolarization throughout the circuit in a coordinated and organized fashion. For this reason, the SA node is also commonly referred to as the pacemaker. The movement of the action potential through the heart creates strong enough electrical disturbances that it can be detected with electrodes placed on a subject's skin. This discovery resulted in the development of the field of electrocardiography, in which surface electrodes are placed at precise locations on both wrists, on the left ankle, and along the chest wall. The movement of the action potential creates deflections in the measure of electrical potential between each of these leads, with each providing information from a slightly different perspective. 
you can compare it to when we take both AP and lateral radiographic images to diagnose a condition. Each view provides a different perspective and supplies some information that is missing in the other view. Same thing here. There are details about the movement of the electrical current that can be picked up in some of these leads, but not others. There are a total of 12 separate views, referred to as leads, that can be used to interpret the electrical activity of the heart. The information from a 12-lead ECG can be displayed in a graphical format, with all 12 leads presented simultaneously, as shown here. Interpreting a 12-lead ECG is far beyond the scope of the present discussion. A trained cardiologist will have spent years studying ECG patterns in order to accurately identify abnormalities that could indicate cardiac arrhythmias and heart disease. The purpose here is to introduce you to the concept of the 12-lead ECG pattern and how it's used in clinical medicine. The ECG pattern can also be more simplistically expressed as an amalgamated pattern representing the overall magnitude of electrical conduction through the heart. This is the ECG pattern you are most familiar with and which we started off this video with. The simplified view is one that we can spend some time interpreting. The first stage of the ECG is known as the P wave. This corresponds with depolarization within the SA node and the subsequent spread of the action potential through the atria to trigger atrial contraction. The second stage is the PR segment. The line lies flat as there is a slight pause in the movement of electrical potential. In the last segment, we said that the atrioventricular septum is electrically insulated. This creates a barrier that prevents the direct transmission of electrical current from the atria to the ventricles. Towards the end of this stage, the action potential reaches a second cluster of neural cells located within the interatrial septum close to the coronary sinus, known as the atrioventricular, or AV node. This serves as a gateway for the electrical signal to pass into the ventricles. A fiber tract known as the bundle of Hiss projects from the AV node and pierces the atrioventricular septum to enter the wall of the interventricular septum. Within the septum, the bundle splits into left and right bundle branches that project down to the apex of the heart. From here, they branch extensively within the myocardium, terminating as Purkinje fibers that directly stimulate the myocardium. The flow of depolarization that occurs along this pathway results in the QRS complex and is associated with the depolarization of the left and right ventricles. Notice that depolarization begins at the apex of the ventricles and progresses upwards towards the valves. This means that the contraction will also start at the apex and move upwards, which, when you think about it, generates a much more efficient contraction. Imagine for a moment taking a container of toothpaste. Now, if you squeeze it in the middle, the paste will be pushed out the opening, but notice I'm also pushing paste towards the other end of the tube, which is an inefficient pumping mechanism. Same thing would happen with the heart. A much more efficient mechanism is to grab the tube by the end and squeeze, bringing the toothpaste out. Hey, what a mess. The other major event that occurs in this phase is the repolarization of the SA node and atria. But any pattern that this might make is masked by the depolarization taking place within the ventricles. The next phase is the ST segment, another plateau period between depolarization and repolarization of the ventricles. Finally, the T wave represents repolarization of the ventricles following which there is another plateau and the cycle repeats itself. The amalgamated ECG pattern is not as detailed as what is provided in the 12 lead ECG, but a lot of useful data is still available. On the left, we see a partial list of abnormalities that can be detected in the pattern and what the clinical implications might be. One variant of particular importance on the list is either elevation or, more commonly, depression of the ST segment above or below its normal resting baseline level, which is often an indication of an acute myocardial infarction. It can happen for a number of reasons, even as a natural variant, depending on the person. But if a patient presents to the emergency department or urgent care center with a history of chest pain, 
Abnormalities in the ST segment can be a strong indicator that the patient is experiencing a heart attack. Okay, now it's time to put all the pieces together and get a comprehensive understanding of everything that happens during each stage of the cardiac cycle. We can describe the cardiac cycle in terms of electrical stimulation, the pressures within each chamber of the heart, the mechanics of the valves, and ventricular volumes. We'll start our discussion in the late phase of diastole, when both atria and ventricles are relaxed. In this stage, pressure is lowest in the ventricles. This means that the atrioventricular valves stay open, allowing blood to passively flow from the atria into the ventricles. By the end of this stage, the ventricles will have collected 80% of its blood volume. It also means that the semilunar valves are shut, preventing the backflow of blood from the aorta and pulmonary trunk. The next stage begins with atrial depolarization, as represented by the P wave in the ECG pattern. The atria contract in response, filling the ventricles with the final 20% of blood volume. In the next stage, the QRS complex triggers the start of ventricular contraction. There is a sharp rise in pressure within the ventricles, which surpasses that in the atria. At the moment that the ventricular pressure exceeds atrial pressure, the atrioventricular valves snap shut, resulting in the first heart sound. Okay, so let's back up for a moment here. What do I mean by the first heart sound? Think about a typical heartbeat. No, wait a second, let me help you out for a minute. There we go. Now, if you listen carefully, you'll notice that with each beat, there are actually two sounds being made. They're typically described phonetically as lub and dub, and are generated by the slapping together of the valve cusps when first the AV valves, then the semilunar valves close. So at the start of this stage, Closing of the atrioventricular valves creates the lub that we know as the first heart sound. In this phase, pressure in the ventricles is higher than the pressure in the atria, but still lower than the pressure in the aorta or pulmonary trunk. This means that for this phase, all four valves are closed, and blood is neither entering or leaving the heart, despite the fact that it is contracting. For this reason, the phase is referred to as isovolumetric ventricular contraction. The next phase, ventricular ejection, begins when the pressure in the ventricles finally surpasses that in the aorta and pulmonary trunk, resulting in opening of the semilunar valves and the injection of blood from the ventricles into the great vessels. Towards the end of this phase, the ventricles begin to repolarize and relax, as noted by the T wave on the ECG pattern. The next phase begins when the pressure in the ventricles once again drops below that in the great vessels, causing the semilunar valves to snap shut resulting in the second heart sound, or dub. At this point, ventricular pressure is still above that seen in the atria, so once again, all valves remain shut. This is referred to as isovolumetric ventricular relaxation. Isovolumetric ventricular relaxation ends when ventricular pressure drops below atrial pressure, allowing the AV valves to once again open and blood to flow passively back into the ventricles. This takes us back to passive filling, and the cycle repeats itself. It's mind-boggling to think about everything that happens in a single heartbeat. Pause for a moment to take your pulse while watching this animation. The mechanics that take place at each individual stage are not overly complex, but when you consider the rapidity with which all of this happens, well, it's a lot to take in. As mentioned earlier, all neural cells within the heart are capable of spontaneous depolarization, but the fastest rate occurs in the SA node. The action potential spreads rapidly from the starting point, pushing the other regions of the heart to threshold in a coordinated fashion, called a normal sinus rhythm. So, what would happen if this wasn't the case? For example, what if another region of the heart were to become even more excitable than the SA node? Well, it happens more often than you might think. We call these regions of hyperexcitable cells ectopic pacemakers. If an ectopic pacemaker occurs in the left atria, for example, the action potential would spread from left to right instead of right to left. The individual would probably not notice anything different, but the movement of current in an opposite direction would lead to an inversion in the P wave. In other words, you would have a downward deflection of the P wave instead of upward. It can be a little bit more dramatic when an ectopic pacemaker occurs in the ventricular wall. 
In this case, ventricular contraction occurs at more or less the same time as atrial contraction, a condition known as a premature ventricular contraction. Very little blood is moved as the ventricles did not have an adequate time to fill. Following a PVC, as they are abbreviated, there is a longer than usual diastole as the ventricle once again falls into normal sinus rhythm. You've probably all experienced this on occasion, and it's normally described as your heart missing a beat. For the next beat, the ventricular volume is greatly increased due to the backup of blood that is waiting to enter the ventricles. So if you're familiar with this sensation, you might remember a hard thump in that catch-up beat. Ectopic pacemakers can occur for a variety of reasons. They can be temporary, such as with electrolyte imbalances, or exposure to chemical stimulants, such as caffeine. I personally found through trial and error that if I drink green tea for more than three days straight, I'll actually end up with very frequently occurring PVCs. They can also be more permanent due to damage along the conduction pathway that prevents the SA node from setting the pace. While the occasional PVC is nothing to be worried about, frequent PVCs can be concerning as there is potential to develop other more serious arrhythmias. The most serious of these is ventricular fibrillation, often abbreviated VFib, which can actually be a little confusing. I'll explain why in a little bit. In a normal sinus rhythm, the ventricular wall is activated and contracts in a coordinated fashion to eject blood from the heart. In ventricular fibrillation, this coordinated activity is lost, and spontaneous depolarization occurs at random points throughout the ventricular walls. At any given point, different regions of the ventricular walls are in varying states of depolarization and repolarization, contraction and relaxation. ECG tracings are accordingly disrupted with no identifiable QRS complex. The movement of the ventricles is described as having a bag of worms appearance because of the wiggling appearance. The uncoordinated contractions prevents the heart from generating enough pressure to force blood through the vascular system and creates a life-threatening situation. The immediate treatment for ventricular fibrillation is defibrillation, sometimes referred to as defib. So remember what I said a moment ago about the term VFib being confusing? VFib, or ventricular fibrillation, is treated with defib, or defibrillators. VFib, DFib. You see the difference? The treatment involves sending a strong electrical pulse across the heart. The idea is, if enough of the heart tissue can be caught in a phase of relative refractory, the impulse will be enough to trigger a unified depolarization of the heart all at once. With a bit of luck, the SA node can be given a chance to reestablish a normal sinus rhythm and get the heart going again. The treatment is so effective that they now have automated external defibrillators, or AEDs, available at most public venues that can be operated with little or no training. Of course, if you're prone to cardiac arrhythmias, it doesn't make much sense to have someone following you around all day with paddles, ready to jolt you if you look peaky. That's where cardiac pacemakers come in. It's an indwelling unit that is surgically implanted subcutaneously in the left thorax. A single or multiple leads are fed through the left subclavian vein into the left brachiocephalic trunk, the superior vena cava, and ultimately the right atrium. The leads are typically placed close to the AV node, at the apex of the heart, or both. When an arrhythmia is detected, the leads send an electronic pulse to these locations to reestablish sinus rhythm. So, fun fact here, notice that I said that if an electrode is implanted in the right ventricle, it's by the apex. Remember what we said about ventricular depolarization starting at the apex and spreading superiorly. Well, the cardiologist paid attention in anatomy, and that is why the electrode is placed where it's placed. Since we're on the topic, I thought I would share a neat little video that I took a few years back of a pacemaker implanted in a 3D printed heart, where LED lights have been connected to the different leads. You can see the pulse delay between the atrial and ventricular leads which matches the delay between P waves and QRS complexes to stagger atrial and ventricular contractions. The unit can even increase its rate in response to agitation, which would be expected during physical activity. Apparently, they used to use accelerometers instead of movement detectors to alter heart rate. You can only imagine what happened to those poor people when taking off in an airplane. 
Last topic for the session. We've discussed the normal path of blood through the heart, but we need to stop for a moment and consider the movement of blood through the fetal heart. During fetal development, pressures in the pulmonary system are particularly high. This is because the lungs are filled with amniotic fluid rather than air. Rather than force the poor developing heart to push blood against this resistance, there are two embryological shunts that allows blood to bypass the pulmonary circuit. Remember, the lungs are not yet involved in gas exchange. That's the job of the placenta. So there's no need for blood to pass through the pulmonary circuit yet. The first shunt is an opening within the interatrial septum known as the foramen ovale, which allows blood to pass from the right atrium directly into the left. The second shunt is the ductus arteriosus, which allows blood to pass from the pulmonary trunk directly into the aorta. Immediately after birth, when the baby takes its first few breaths, the amniotic fluid is expelled from the lungs and replaced with air. This results in a drastic drop in pressure in the pulmonary circuit and consequently the right atrium, which reverses the flow of blood between the atria. Blood in the left atrium pushes against a tissue flap that serves as a rudimentary one-way valve, sealing off the foramen ovale. Over time, the flap fuses with the septal wall, forming a noticeable indentation known as the fossa ovalis. Similarly, the drop in pressure in the pulmonary trunk stops the flow of blood through the ductus arteriosus into the aorta. The lumen is eventually sealed off, leaving a remnant connecting the aorta and pulmonary trunk, known as the ligamentum arteriosum. Fusing over of these shunts is not always perfect. Occasionally, the flap forming the fossa ovalis does not completely cover the foramen ovale, resulting in a patent foramen ovale, commonly referred to as a hole in the heart. When this happens, blood can pass directly between the left and right atria. Mild cases can be asymptomatic, and the person may go their entire lives without realizing there is an issue. In more severe situations, a significant amount of deoxygenated blood may bypass pulmonary circulation, reducing arterial oxygen saturation. This can result in cyanosis, and in newborns is referred to as blue baby syndrome. Repair of the defect is a common vascular surgery in which a device is implanted to properly seal off the residual opening. That does it for the second session on heart conduction and the cardiac cycle. After the break, we'll finish the content off by looking at the mediastinum, which is the space occupied by the heart. We'll see you then.